Okay, we're gonna start with our desert scene and this Castle Valley, Moab, Utah palette from The Art of Soil is the perfect, perfect um, palette for us here. So I'm gonna start with the sky. Um, I might try and do a couple clouds with our shop towel here and that's kind of a fun technique that I'll show you. So I'm gonna first mix up a little sky and I'm gonna do so by um, actually mixing up a couple different colors here because that desert sky is something else isn't it and you'd be more than welcome to try a sunset or kind of that like graded wash that we did earlier um, this might look neat with some twilight colors blues and purples or these sunset colors that I've tried it with here um, I'm gonna go for a blue sky and we'll see how this pans out for me. So um, one thing I've learned is that you definitely wanna mix up more color than you think. Um, I always tend to not make enough color. So that is a continual problem that I seem to run into. And what I'm doing here is just picking up pigment adding it to my mix, adding water. I might add a little of this nice purple to just get a more unique mix here. So I'm gonna try a little more blue, a little more blue, and we're off. So again, this is one of those techniques where the wet on dry will work nicely for, um, you know, managing these kind of nooks and crannies. It can be difficult um, with wet on wet, so um, it's really your, your own preference, but I'm gonna go wet on dry here. And, um, oh, I also have forgotten to tape this down. So taping it down will give you a really nice crisp border. Um, I personally like to <laughs> put it on a clipboard um, and that way uh, I can tilt it and adjust it as I like but I've already kind of started my um, sky here so it's not wise to stop so um, that was my bad but we're just gonna keep going I'll kind of define a nice border there and then we'll add tape after this step so Again, I'm using that wet on dry to achieve a little more control over these, um, these delineations between rock and sky. So work fast. You want to accomplish this while the paint is wet. Um, admittedly, a bigger brush would probably be better for painting something like this. You've got a size four round. Um, I normally paint this with something a little bit bigger, but I could only do one brush in the kit. So if you're having fun and enjoying this process, I would suggest getting a, um, a flat brush in a bigger size because that is really great for covering more territory with these types of skies and paintings. So um, working here while it's still wet, you can see because it is still wet, I'm able to work with this and not end up with any lines or um, differentiation. And I, I'm, I'm going for that uniform graded or flat wash that we, um, we tried in that that second exercise. So I'm going for a flat wash and that requires me to work quickly. So I'm not mincing words here and I am working as quickly as I can to apply all the paint. Again, this will be easier with a larger brush. So this is a little tricky with a brush of this size, but at least we don't have a huge painting to work with here. So I'm going to add a little more pigment in these areas that are a little lighter. And 
it can be fun while this paint is still wet to blot out some clouds like that. You, this paper, this um, particular brand of paper towel is really absorbent, so it's pretty cool um, for doing stuff like that. And then you can kind of add some purpley shadows. I'm gonna go back in there and blot, oops, there's some, a leaf, I don't know, that probably came from my cat. He is a bad boy. So blot out some more. These are just so fun for making clouds. I really enjoy that. But again, you've got to work pretty quick because the second that um, paint dries up, your window of opportunity is kind of closed. So um, you can add some more shadows. Um, again, just work very organically. Nothing, nothing about this is planned out. It's all just loosey-goosey. So um, I am now going to tape my paper. I should have done this first, but you can do this directly to your work surface if it's not going to damage your work surface. It depends on where you're at with that, but this is my work table, so I don't mind getting a little bit of paint on it. Um, and this just produces really nice crisp borders. You gotta press pretty firmly and it will also help as the paper gets wet, it tends to buckle a little bit. So it can also help with that buckling. Um, I tend to work on watercolor pads where the paper is actually affixed or watercolor blocks where the paper is actually affixed to a pad which helps to reduce a lot of the buckling. So I prefer watercolor blocks and you can find a link to those in the blog post that I'll link in the video. So there we go. Now we're officially ready. Um, so again with watercolor, if I start painting this, this blue sky isn't totally dry. So I could get some colors bleeding in there and I don't want that today. So I'm gonna start from the bottom while this is drying. And so hopefully by the time we get up here, I'm gonna have a dry sky and I can work on these rocks without like ending up with colors bleeding into each other. So that's really important. Um, when you're working in layers like this, you want to completely let the layer above you or below you dry before you start the adjacent layer or else you're gonna get colors bleeding and mixing, which can be nice in some instances, but today it's not really what we're looking for. So I'm gonna continue some wet on wet painting here in this foreground. Um, with the landscapes, you typically want the foreground colors to be brighter than your um, background colors. This is further away, therefore it won't appear as intense as the colors that I'll have here in my foreground. So I'm going to apply some pretty intense colors here in the foreground while I'm working. I might even grab color directly off the, the paint here to um, ensure that it's as intense as I want it to be. And you can mix right on the paper if you're working wet on wet, which is kind of fun. Okay, so our blue sky is totally dry now. Um, as you can see, the, the watercolor always dries lighter than, um, than when it appears to be wet. So we kind of lost our clouds back there, but you could go in and apply another layer if you like, accentuating those white outlines. I'm gonna leave this for now and um, continue working on my foreground here with some kind of bright browns, reds, and purples. So now I'm gonna try some dry on dry for this next layer. I think I'm just feeling, and follow your heart here. I'm just going to apply 
some purple streaks while my brown paint is still wet. And you can add more pigment to create variation. Add more pigment or water, really, to create more variation in your color swatches here. I think that looks more interesting than an even wash or a flat wash, as we learned um, in our first lesson there. So I'm gonna grab some purple and add it in there just to give it a little more dimension and visual interest. I think that purple and brown looks really nice, but let your heart pick your colors. So I'm gonna reference my mixing chart. Now this is the beauty of a mixing chart because I can see what color I think might look nice um, in sequence here. And um, I'm really liking this. Um, red and purple mix, so I might get, or excuse me, red and blue, so I might mix some of that up. I love how intense that red is. It's a really intense, highly pigmented paint. Um, so there we go, that's a pretty good 50-50 mix. And you'll see um, it's much less translucent than the layers we've previously ap applied. So I'm gonna get a little buck wild here and go heavier on the water and use that water to distribute the paint. That's when you might get more of that interesting patterning. Um, hi, Darwin. You sound sad. Are you hoping for your, your lunch now, buddy? You forgot that you don't eat lunch. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. I think that looks neat. I'm gonna add a little more color here as soon as I finish this section. And I realize I'm working pretty fast here, so if you, if you need to slow down or pause the video, that is totally fine. I'm gonna trace this contour line with some more intense red because I like how that's bleeding. Remember when I mentioned that um, when you have two sections of foreground or background and you put wet paint next to wet paint that's drying, you can see that is kind of traveling down into the brown section we painted earlier. It's a cool effect, but it's just something you'd be aware of as we're painting here. So um, I'm going to continue on. Hey, Darwin, do you want to join us? Darwin's the cat. He is the ruler of the roost, so he might come say hello. All right, and I like this beautiful sandstone color, so I'm gonna add that here and see what happens. Again, the beauty of watercolors is that their transparency often lends itself well to creating layers and just like very rich textured layers of um, pigment, so it can be fun to work in layers as well, waiting for this layer to completely dry before adding another um, flat wash or translucent, translucent, lucent looking wash ahead of it. So I'm gonna, you can kind of see this mesa poking out in the back here. I'm gonna hold off on painting him until this is dry, because I don't want those two bleeding. And I'm also going to probably paint it with a little bit less intensity because it is further in the background. So I'm gonna start on this um, landform in the back um, while we wait for that section to dry. I really like this, this color. So I'm gonna maybe mix it with some red. And again, I'm gonna water it down so it's just not so intense. 
because it is looming in the distance. It's not right up in our business in the foreground. So I'm gonna kind of water that down a little. And again, wet on dry here. I'm just gonna trace the contours of this particular landform. I can use this black line as a buffer so that when I go to paint this thing next, the colors won't bleed so much. So I'm trying not to get that black line wet. So again, I'm working fast here because I want to work with the wet properties of the paint. Here we go. And then I'm gonna add some visual interest here with just a different pigment. This is quite a bit darker and I'm just letting it do what it wants. Whatever, you know, I like the organic nature of watercolor and I'm gonna kind of just let the paint dictate where it wants to go. So that's my last landform. That did come out a little more intense than I was hoping, so I might try and pick up a little bit of that pigment. Looks like it might be too late. Um, by blotting it on my paper here. Yeah, you can, you can pick up a little bit of that. It's a little darker than I would have intended, but no harm, no foul. All right, I am looking at my mixing chart again. I wanna create some contrast, so I might pick one of these more orangey colors. I'm kind of interested in this one, the third option on our Castle Valley palette. Again, I'm trying to go fairly light with this. So I'm, I'm just kind of doing as I go here. I've got very little rhyme, not so much reason. And just making it happen. Now you can kind of work with some shadows on this one because it is a very three-dimensional object. The opposite of orange is purple. So I'm actually gonna grab a little bit of this purple pigment that's left over in my palette and add it here as a shadow on this big butte. Um, so that's kind of fun, that's another Good trick is that when you're doing shadows, the complementary color on the color wheel often can give you really rich or interesting shadows. The same works for gray. You really don't want to paint a shadow a harsh black color. I find that adding gray to a color or working with its complementary color is a very interesting way to create shadow on your piece. So this side would not be as dark because we've added the shadow here. So I am not adding shadow there. I think I'm out of paint there. Um, And you'll see as, as this paint starts to dry, it, it won't move around as easily. And all that is is practice, is learning to figure out the different phases of the painting as it dries. Now I'm gonna pick a different color for this mesa because I really want it to pop out as like a different or separate landform. So I might go with 
our number four and a gray. So here's our Moab number four. I'm gonna mix a little of that with some gray. This gray is not as pigmented, so um, it will be easily overwhelmed by the yellow in our palette here. Get that brighter. So try and pick up a good amount of gray if you are indeed using that color because it is not as staining of a pigment. So I'm only gonna grab a tiny bit of my other color here. And yeah, that's nice. I like that. It's got a good sandstony feel to it. And then I might grab another to add some variation. As we work here. So I'm losing, I once again haven't mixed up enough paint here, so I'm kind of milking it. You'll find that you might have to mix more as you go, which is problem I often encounter. But the variation in color also makes a fairly interesting composition, so don't, don't fret about it. The only time it's really consequential is when you're trying to create a, a gradient in a sky or a sunset and you run out of the color you need. I always try and mix a ton when I'm working with skies or trying to create graded washes for skies or gradients. So I'm gonna get a little buck wild and just trace the contours of some of these lines because I think that will add some visual interest while it's still wet here. It'll lead across the paper a bit and just be interesting. So it's best to wait until this painting is dry to remove your tape. So once it's dry, we'll remove the tape and uh, we'll see how it came out. Okay, so this is all dry now. I'm going to pull off my tape here. And you can see that makes a nice crisp line. Again, I forgot, so my top line isn't quite as nice because I forgot to put the tape on in the beginning, but then you have a really nice painting with a crisp border. So thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this desert scene. You can pop your name in the bottom and uh, congrats on your glorious Mesa.